Welcome to the Paladin 1 to 90 leveling skills guide. In this guide, we'll cover all of your skills as you train to be unlimited blade wicks better than the rest of them, but also hopefully kill your enemies along the way. Watch as you go from this. You're at full HP! To this. That's what we've been yeah, waiting for! Baby. That's what I've been waiting for! That's what it's all about! This series is framed in the mindset of players completely new to Final Fantasy XIV or the MMO genre in general, or generally just still inexperienced. In that same vein, this will merely be an overview of the actions and how to use them. Optimal rotations are better left to their own in-depth videos just due to how much complexity is involved in perfect openers and overall rotations. This is not meant to be a purely optimal guide. If you wish to be optimal at level cap, there are further places you could research your job on. We will, however, be crafting rotations as we go to help new players understand what goes through creating openers and give them a foothold to push themselves into being able to do it on their own. The goal is to drop players in on the ground level so they can make strides to improve themselves. All tooltips will be shown at the level cap for each section. Level 50 for Realm Reborn, Level 60 for Heavensward Skills, Level 70 for Stormblood Stuff, Level 80 for Shadowbringers Levels, and Level 90 for Endwalker. I also recommend all players add Sprint and Limit Break to their hotbars, both found in the general tab of your actions menu. And as for how my hotbars build, it'll make sense at 90. Just put skills on your hotbars in a way you feel comfortable using as you are leveling. Everyone has their own way of doing things. If you want more info on how I set up my UI, check the description or the card in the corner for a video about it. And keep the following in mind, patches can change jobs still. Be sure to check the description for any patch notes for minor potency changes, or skill changes, or any other special notes. With all that out of the way, let's begin. Paladin is a tank job all about big defenses and support, good at protecting itself and others. You have some of the strongest single button defensives and a higher base defense thanks to a shield reducing incoming damage. You also have some flexibility in what you can do, but generally less than other tanks due to fewer but stronger mitigations. Your attacking rotation is lengthy and jumps back and forth between physical and magical attacks. And you can flex around whether you begin with the physical attacks or the magical attacks, ending with big and flashy burst attacks. Ultimately, it flows together nicely, despite managing dots, a buff, and the constant swapping between sets of attacks. To play a gladiator, you either start as one, or pick the class up in the Old Dog Gladiators Guild after completion of your level 10 class quest as your starting class. Let's get into the finer details of each skill now. Level 1, Tank Mastery. Before we get into the job, we have to mention that tanks are sturdier than any other role. You have a built-in 20% damage reduction, higher returns to HP from Vitality, and it says bonus to damage based on strength, but you're still weaker than an average DPS. Just keep in mind, being more defensive doesn't mean you can just casually stand in all the AoEs that come your way. Level 1, Fast Blade. This is a very basic attack. It does 150 potency to the target. Nothing impressive, but it gets us started. Level 2, Fight or Flight. This is a buff that has a 60 second cooldown, increasing all of our physical damage by 25% for 25 seconds. The fact that it is physical only won't matter for quite a long time, but keep that in mind. The goal of fight or flight is to use this on cooldown as much as possible, and fit in all of your best attacks within the timer. We'll be getting a bunch of this later, just make sure you keep attacking and use fight or flight as much as possible. Level 4, Riot Blade. This is our first combo attack. It does 100 potency unless you use it after Fast Blade, then it will do 230 potency of damage. Combos will flash their borders when available, and you should be completing your combos whenever you can. The glow is shown here. You should always do your combos, and going forward I will only mention potencies of doing the combo. Use this to do bigger damage to enemies, simple as that. Level 6, Total Eclipse. This is an AoE, or Area of Effect, attack. It does 100 potency to all enemies within 5 yarms of your character. Anytime there are multiple enemies, you should swap to using Total Eclipse over your 2-hit combo. This will change later, but at this level, multiple enemies always means to use Total Eclipse. The more enemies there are, the better AoE gets. So the more enemies there are, the more enemies you pull to fight, the stronger this attack gets. It's 100 potency to every enemy, not 100 potency spread across all enemies. 
and so the better the tank you become, the more enemies you want to be gathering together, both for you and especially for your DPS allies. And as a side note, this will break your single target combo if used between strikes. Level 8 is our first roll action, Rampart. Tank roll actions are some of the most important roll actions in the game. Please learn what all of these do. The description has a video about these skills, as does the card in the corner. Please learn, but I will not be going deep into details here. Level 10, Iron Will. This ability comes with a new UI element, a gem that glows when the skill is activated. If you do not see this gem glowing, hit Iron Will to turn it on. With the exception of 8 or more player content, you always, and I mean always, want this on. You are a tank, and you are the one all enemies should be attacking. Iron Will gives you a massive enmity multiplier to all actions you do, ensuring you keep enemies eating your face, enmity being a measure of how much enemies want to murder you. In your party list, when targeting an enemy, the enmity levels of your party is shown. You want the lead as a tank, with an A. The enemy list also has colored indicators for current enmity levels. Red square means you're in the lead. Anything else, you're not in the lead. The exception I list is 8 or more player content, which means there are multiple tanks, 2 or 3 of them usually, depending on which content at least. You absolutely do not want to be fighting your co-tanks for aggro. One of you is in charge of the boss, the other is in charge of picking up adds, additional enemies, or the boss when the other tank dies or is otherwise not available to tank. General idea, whoever puts their enmity stance on first when entering a duty is in charge of the boss. Every tank has an iron will, but the name will differ. You'll get used to the icons and animations as you go, but it's a rule to follow. Or maybe go based on which tank has more gear and HP. Ultimately though, the best way to choose is to communicate with text. If you play with controller, buy a cheap $5 USB keyboard. It's worth it. Beyond who is tanking the boss, you want to be ready to take the boss if the other tank dies. So after a minute or so into the fight, turn on Iron Will even if you're the designated off tank. This will ensure that you are second in enmity above the DPS and healers. So if the tank does die, the boss doesn't start hitting the rest of your allies. It will immediately start hitting you, saving someone else from die. The other thing to worry about is when entering duties with level sync. If you are, say, level 50 and go into a duty lower than level 50 with Iron Will on, it turns off. Always, always, always make sure Iron Will is on when you need it. This must be stressed. Be ready to hit the button every time you enter a new duty. This is especially important with dungeons since you're the only tank. Otherwise it boils down to turn it on, then hit enemies as hard as you can. Side note, higher end content, this relationship changes and tank swaps become a thing. Level 10, Shield Bash. This is a little bit of crowd control, or the idea that you can prevent enemies from doing stuff for a bit. It does a puny 100 potency to a target and stuns them for 6 seconds with diminishing returns. A second hit will cut the time in half, stunning the target for 3 seconds, with a third use cutting it in half again to 1.5 seconds. Afterwards, the enemy will become immune to stuns entirely, at least until an invisible decay makes them susceptible to the status once more. The problem with this is you almost never want to be using Shield Bash. In two levels we get a better stun called a low blow, but it has a short cooldown. It being single target means you're massively hampering your damage with groups of enemies, and a dead enemy deals less damage than a stunned enemy. Tanks aren't the level of power of a DPS, but they're not lightweights, and when it comes to reducing damage, you have outright better options than stun. For bosses, they quickly become entirely immune to stuns. There will be an exception here or there, but come level 50, most all bosses become entirely immune to all normal status effects but one. The exceptions, you have a better skill that doesn't waste attacking time. Now, there isn't zero uses of shield bash. Being able to spam it is usually terrible, 
but Hawk Manor has that one part where two succubi are together. These enemies always start with a large AoE. With Low Blow, you can only stun one of the succubi. With Shield Bash, we can Low Blow one and Shield Bash the other. It's not groundbreaking, but it's quicker than waiting for the AoEs to go off. There's uses here or there, but again, they're not very common. And if spamming Shield Bash on a group of six enemies is better than just using total clips, then you have bigger issues to be sorting out, like proper cooldown usage, or trying to help teach a healer to use theirs. We have another roll action at level 12, Low Blow. This is the Shield Bash replacement. If you need more than one stun for stopping AoEs, Shield Bash is there, but it's not your main stun. There is also Provoke at level 15. Level 15, Shield Lob. You do not automatically obtain this skill, this is a class quest skill. Please, especially as a tank, do your class and job quests. I will not be verbally mentioning every skill that is a quest skill, but in the top left is a denotion of this. Please, just do your quests. As for Shield Lob itself, this is an engagement and positioning tool. From within 20 yards away, you can throw your shield at the enemy for a weak 100 potency of damage. It has a further enmity multiplier in case you lose aggro on a target, or the target is far away, or need to position it. I like to use it to initiate combat. It drags enemies towards me as I run towards them, allowing me to grab aggro on them all sooner or in bosses, position them in the middle of the arena. I also mentioned already losing aggro on a target. If for some reason the black mage in the back there has taken aggro on an enemy, you can shield lob to quick grab the enemy and get full aggro back. Otherwise, you really don't want to use this much. Much like shield bash, it's single target and weak. Other than initiating fights, the range of the skill is not that helpful. You don't want to be out of range of enemies. And anytime you are, you won't be out of range for long. Later on, we get better options for range attacking, and overall, it's just a bad use of time. It won't break your combos or anything, but you're not having any real effect either if you already have enmity. And I mean, we already have provoke, so... Roll actions come in, giving us interject at level 18 and reprisal at level 22. Level 26, Rage of Halone. This is the third hit to our combo, comboing off of Riot Blade. It does 330 potency of damage to a target. Because of how strong this is, it becomes more effective to use single target attacks when there are one or two enemies. However, this does not mean you only attack one enemy until it dies. If you wish to do this, you must swap back and forth on both enemies to maintain aggro. Either Total Eclipse to make sure you keep aggro, or keep swapping targets. To obtain the Paladin job, you must first reach level 30 and complete the level 30 Gladiator quest. Additionally, complete the main scenario quest, Self Management, which is at level 20 in the story. Return to the guild and the quest should be there for you. Level 30, Spirits Within. This is a simple bit of extra damage for us. Spirits Within has a 30 second cooldown to do 270 potency of damage to a target. Just use this anytime you can, no matter what the situation is. It's free damage. Ideally use this under Fight or Flight 2, but because it's a 30 second cooldown, you will get two spirits within for every Fight or Flight, so every other use will not be buffed. Arm's length is level 32, and let me just stress this one. This is a defensive cooldown. Yes, actually. Go watch the video. Level 35, Oath Mastery and Sheltron. Oath Mastery gives our little gem a big upgrade into a full-on bar. Iron Will is now a big shield embellishment when activated. A lot more obvious than a small gem, but the real part of this skill is the bar itself. Filling the bar is done by hitting anything with auto attacks. You get 5 gauge for every auto attack, but you will notice that entering any duty, your bar begins full. To make the associated skill easier to start using, Paladin will begin every duty with a full 100 gauge. So let's talk about that skill, which is Sheltron. Sheltron will guarantee all attacks are blocked for 4 seconds, at the cost of 50 gauge. You will likely have noticed by now that your shields have a block stat and block attacks intermittently. You will even be told how much the block negated. This does add up to some significant reduction in damage over time. 
but the problem is that it's random. Shell Chun solves that downside for a couple of seconds. It's very short, but some decent mitigation. Can even reach levels over 20% depending on the quality of your shield and the dungeon you are in. And due to your auto attacks occurring often, you'll get a lot of uses of Sheltron, as if this is a 30 second or shorter cooldown. Don't be afraid to use this often for reducing damage from trash mobs, or big hitting tank busters and bosses. You'll almost always have this available. Level 38, Sentinel. Sentinel is a much more typical piece of mitigation. It has a long 2 minute cooldown, lasts for 15 seconds, and reduces all damage by a massive 30%. This is a must-use for the higher points of damage in a duty. Pull 10 enemies, pop Sentinel, and maybe even Sheltron ones. In the 15 second timer, you'll get much of that gauge back. It's directly opposed to Sheltron in that way. Sheltron is encouraged to be used extremely often. While you wouldn't purposefully hold Sentinel for a long time or anything, you want to be smarter with your uses. Once you pull all the enemies you intend to pull, pop it off while enemies are at their most dangerous. Keep in mind, you don't want to use cooldowns BEFORE an encounter. You waste time on them that way, and with a cooldown this strong, every second of damage reduction counts. Level 40, Prominence. This is a combo off of our AoE, Total Eclipse into Prominence, which does a much stronger 170 potency per enemy. This brings AoE spam back to being stronger than single target attacks in two enemies. But that's not super required overall, just make sure you're keeping aggro and using your AoE combo. Prominence is a huge boost in power next to Total Eclipse. Level 45, Cover. This button is so niche and difficult to use, you may have noticed in the intro that it isn't on my hotbars. Cover costs 50 gauge, losing yourself a potential Sheltron, has a 2 minute cooldown, and has a very limited range of 10 yoms. You must select an ally and hit the skill to cover them. This causes all damage that player takes to transfer to you, so long as they stay within the range displayed by a very faint tether. The benefits of this might be obvious, in that you're making another player take no damage for 12 seconds, or until out of range. Some players will take a lot of avoidable damage, AoEs to avoid, somehow stealing aggro, by your fault or theirs, etc. Sometimes this leads them to take vulnerability stacks and take even more damage. Cover ensures the one team member with high HP and defense is the one taking the brunt of what might otherwise kill the weakened player. With some sick moves, this can save lives. At the cost of your own potential life. That's where the problems begin. Depending on how much a player is messing up, they could mess up so bad they take damage enough to kill you overlapping AoEs or some other potential issue. Debuffs they receive under cover transfer to you even. If you've played Dragoon before the removal of the Dragon Sight Tether, this is shorter than Dragon Sight's Tether, only by two yams, but any Dragoon knows that keeping a partner in range can be... exhausting. Cover is no less difficult to achieve, even more so. In your average party, Ranged, Mage, and the healer party members will stand well a ways away from you, even when that's a bad idea. Cover will not reach them if they're far away, so you'll have to run over, hit cover, and potentially move the boss into a bad position or some other issue. Larger bosses, even melee players are too far away. Standing deep inside the boss's hitbox, melee DPS behind the boss can still be too far away to cover. Then anytime you actually can tether them with cover, their mistakes become yours. Bone stacks, debuffs, other things, it could turn you into a pin cushion of death. Cover shines better in 8 player trials and raids, especially the high end ones. When co-tanking on Paladin, you can cover the main tank, taking damage in their place for a couple seconds, all without requiring a tank swap. Which would have usually been better anyway, because then you could use Sheltron instead. Again, there are actual uses, and there are actually situations where that covering the main tank is a good thing to do. It's just overly niche for an average player. High-end tank buster cheese is great, and it's okay if some skills are only useful in high-end, I'd argue. It just means I need to warn the dangers of improper usage. Make sure you can actually save the player you intend to cover, if you even can use cover.
Our final role action is Shirk at level 48. Level 50, Circle of Scorn. On a short 30 second cooldown, this does a 100 potency AoE around yourself with a 5 yarm range. In addition to the base hit, all enemies affected will receive a dot or a damage over time for 15 seconds. This does 30 potency on a server tick, which are every 3 seconds. As a result, we have 5 ticks of 30 potency, or 150 potency damage over time, totaling the power to 250 potency per enemy. This is an ability, so you can weave it between weapon skills with no loss, and since it's free damage, you want to use it for single target, but especially for AoE situations. Even at level 50, most enemies will live for 15 seconds or close to it. So you're getting a far stronger hit than even prominence on all enemies. It's otherwise no different to any normal other OGCD attack, like Spirits Within. Throw it out under Fight or Flight when you can, and the ones where Fight or Flight isn't available, just use as soon as possible. Level 50, Hollowed Ground. With the longest cooldown in the game, at 420 seconds, 7 whole minutes, Hollowed Ground grants you 10 seconds of complete invincibility. The only exceptions are typically high-end raid mechanics, so you can't cheese some sort of normally instant wipe mechanics, but even some of those this works for. Oh, and cover. Cover goes through Hollowed Ground, so you will take full damage if for whatever reason you need to cover during Hollowed. The initial reaction most people seem to have is, this is an emergency button. This thought is wrong. What's the point in such a strong button you'll almost never use if all it's for is for emergencies? This button can prevent the emergency to begin with. Stood in a bunch of AoEs and now you're about to die, so now it's an emergency? If you used Hollowed Ground before you stood in those AoEs and stood in them on purpose this time, you would have taken zero damage and no Vuln stacks. If you want to go and pull 20 enemies, you can because you're immune to damage for 10 seconds. Then as Hollowed Ground runs out, you can pop Sentinel or Rampart or anything now that damage is coming in. By the time the enemies die, you'll still have some left or just be about running out. Tell your healer before you start pulling, hey I'm gonna use my invuln, and they know they don't even need to heal you, they can do some damage themselves, or Get partnered with a white mage, and they can stand there for 10 seconds. Then as Hollowed falls off, start using Holy, which effectively will give you another 5 to 6 seconds of invulnerability. And given most dungeon runs will go over 15 minutes or even more, you can get 3 uses of this depending on the dungeon. Pace of the dungeon and ability of the group is always a factor, but that's far more than the zero if your feared emergencies never happen. Plus, Hollowed Ground is easy to waste in quote-unquote emergencies. If you press it as you die, and you lose the use entirely, the cooldown will still count as used, despite you dying. And if you don't release your body to the start of the dungeon, because maybe it's mid-pull and you need to be raised now, you're not getting it back. So say the emergency wasn't as bad as you thought or such, you'll just be raised and carry on without hollowed. Emergencies are easier to mark out in 8 player content like Trials and Raids, specific mechanics that might kill the party, or you need just 10 seconds more alive before the boss kills you, you can finish it off without wiping. But there's no real way to know if or when that will happen. Meanwhile, you can otherwise use Hollowed at some point to negate tank busters or otherwise heavy damage. Be more proactive with using Hollowed. You may not get to spam it, but you can use it to huge effect. At the very least, it's going to take 10 more seconds for you to die, but the effects tend to ripple across an entire encounter and be even more beneficial than that. But let's finally talk about openers, which keep in mind are a single target kind of thing, we have 50 levels of skills now, but overall not much to do when it comes to an opener. A buff, a couple off-global attacks, and that's really it. This makes it easier for us to weave in defensive buffs as needed for bosses. Tank buster happening during your opener? You have room to use Sentinel or such. The only goal we have to worry about is making sure we use everything under fight or flight. So let's do that. Shield Lob. Fast Blade. Fight or Flight. 
Riot Blade. Rage of Halone. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Circle of Scorn. Rage of Halone. Spirits Within. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Rage of Halone. And then it just keeps going. As said, the important part of this is getting our global attacks used and in the middle of fight or flight. The specific timings don't need to be in these places, but we're timing them here for reasons we'll see later. Otherwise, you're just spamming 1, 2, 3 over and over. When Spirits Within and Circle of Scorn come off a of cooldown, immediately use them. The only other thing I want to note is the Shield Lob. This too is placeholder for something later but also allows us to position the boss better. Moving the boss into the center of the arena for mechanics, or to just make your melee party members not hate you, is of utmost importance. Your allies being able to do damage is more important than how big your numbers can be. Unless your team is just that bad, which isn't that common. Later, this will do double duty for both being good damage and a way to drag enemies into the middle of arenas. But for now, practice boss positioning with it. Again, middle of the arena is ideal in the majority of cases. It's rarer for a boss to be placed elsewhere. But otherwise, let's go into the karaoke opener. This means I'm going to speak the name of the skills as they are used in time with the opener. Because of this, and the lengths of some of these skill names, I may cut myself off a bit later once the openers get busy. Otherwise, just know that the skills are being used in time with the words being spoken. Shield Lob. Fast Blade. Fight or Flight. Riot Blade. Rage of Halone. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Circle of Scorn. Rage of Halone. Spirits Within. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Rage of Halone. And then it just keeps going. The rotation is going to develop a bit as we go on, but Heaven's Word has a bit more than just rotation stuff, for better and worse. Level 54, Goring Blade. This is a combo off of Riot Blade, just like Rage of Halone, but it does not replace Rage of Halone, not entirely. It has a 250 potency hit, placing a 65 potency dot on any enemy hit for 21 seconds. That's a 455 potency dot. 705 potency attack in total. That is huge. That's more than double the power of Rage of Halone. The only issue being the dot itself. You have to wait for the full power. Technically, this is stronger than your AoE on up to 5 targets, but then you're not using AoE on 5 enemies and liable to lose aggro on one or more of them. And if you're placing it on an enemy that dies sooner than 21 seconds, you're just being ineffective. Feel free to dot both targets if you're fighting two enemies, maybe three if you're feeling fancy. Then swap to AoE after your dots have been applied. Let's more focus back on single target though. Between every Goring Blade combo will be two full combos of Rage of Alone. This will make it that there are eight GCDs, 20 seconds of attacks between uses of Goring Blade. This gives the full timer of the dot while continuously attacking and this should carry us through our entire time in Heaven's Word. Any further additions are superficial, but we're gonna wait till level 60 for discussing the new opener, if just for pacing. Level 56, Divine Veil. On a 90 second cooldown, this places a buff on you. Upon receiving spell-based healing from you or your party, everyone within 15 yams of yourself will be given a shield with 10% of your maximum HP. That's your HP, not each individual party members. You yourself do not get this shield either, and both buffs will last for 30 seconds each. The vast majority of uses for this are not completely up to you. You need to hit the Divine Veil button, but your healer is the one that actually activates the buff. You can't, and when you can, shouldn't, heal yourself. You can't do anything beyond tell your healer you used it for them to use some sort of heal themselves. But there's a problem in itself. Did you place the buff at the right time? There's a 30 second window for the buff, sure, but if you yourself have not taken damage, the healer isn't going to bother throwing a heal on you just to activate Divine Veil. So to make use of Divine Veil best, you want to try and preempt when the healer might give you a spell-based heal. 
So anytime you have a decent chunk of HP remaining, or maybe the healer is overhealing, pop Divine Veil to try and spread a shield around to the group. It's a good way to protect the team. Level 58, Chivalry. Riot Blade and Spirits Within have been given an upgrade. Both of these will now restore MP. Riot Blade restoring 1000 MP and Spirits Within 500 MP. Note that Riot Blade requires you to use it in a combo. You can't spam Riot Blade alone to generate mana. This upgrade is because of the other skill we get at this level. Level 58, Clemency. Costing a massive 4000 mana, this is a single target heal on a 1.5 second cast time. This restores 1000 potency of healing to the target. And if you heal a party member, you will also be healed for 50% of the power of the heal given to your team member. And this is a button you will not be using. When solo, sure, clemency. When in a party, you don't normally need this. A lot of paladins for some reason think, I am missing HP, this means I'm going to die. While that missing HP is 2 of the 20,000 HP. No, it does not mean that. It means you're missing HP and you're still safe, so the healer has done their job. If nobody is dying due to lack of heals, if you are living just fine, you don't need to start spamming clemency. Your healer has a lot of tools for healing. Let them use them. You're not helping by using clemency on the guy that the healer just used their big ability on. You just made the healer regret healing at all. That isn't to say there's no uses for clemency. One of my favorite uses is pre-pull Divine Veil. Before any boss, I will stop, pop Divine Veil, and wait for my party to reach the boss arena. I will clemency before starting the fight to give the team a shield. Any boss that has some form of raid-wide attack in the first 30 seconds will have that attack negated by Divine Veil. Or let's take the example of, yes, someone did die. The healer. You can't completely replace them, but adjusting your rotation to spam Riot Blade combos, you can become the healer. Lightning isn't going to strike twice, but go watch the Shadowbringers video in the section on Clemency. While recording, I managed to get a run where the healer died and we still finished the boss fight. We saved time over wiping, all thanks to Clemency spam. Which let me also just warn here, don't use Clemency as an excuse to refuse to wipe a run. Know when an act like that is warranted, when the boss is already nearly dead. But point is, Clemency does have uses. The issue is a lot of paladins use it when it shouldn't be used. So the full breadth of uses for Clemencies for me are Pre-pull Divine Veil, when the healer dies and I need to take over healing, the healer lets me die and shows they need help, and if I myself mess up my cooldowns. If I messed up my cooldown rotation, I'll tell my healer straight up, I messed up my cooldowns, so I will use Clemency as a cooldown. This way, I admit fault, show I am not distrusting of them all of a sudden, and I don't need to slow down a run when my group is obviously handling wall-to-wall -wall pulling with no issue. This isn't, oops, I used one extra Sheltron, or I used Reprisal when I didn't need that. It will be, I have literally nothing else except a Clemency. No Sentinel, no Hollowed Ground, no anything. It takes that much for me to use Clemency. It will never be a default reaction. If my HP is dropping low, I will assume that was intentional. If people aren't healed, I assume this is intentional. Until the moment we die, I trust the healer has a plan. Because much like you have a plan with Divine Veil, they have a plan with their own cooldowns. Trust your healer until you are a corpse. The penalty for death is pretty low anyway. Level 60, Rage of Halone Mastery and Royal Authority. Rage of Halone Mastery upgrades it into Royal Authority. It's up to a 390 potency attack when used in a combo. It's nice, arguably worse animation, but other than that it doesn't change how we play the job. But it does mean we see a different button in our level 60 opener. Just remember it's the same as Rage of Halone. And the new goal of our opener is to buff Goring Blade twice. Consider that Goring is 21 seconds long, and Fight or Flight is 25 seconds. That means we can fit in the full duration of Goring Blade and then refresh it 
to give it added boosts. This is called snapshotting, buffing the entire dot before the buff runs out. Shield Lob Fast Blade Fight or Flight Riot Blade Goring Blade Fast Blade Riot Blade Circle of Scorn Royal Authority Spirits Within Fast Blade Riot Blade Royal Authority Fast Blade Riot Blade Goring Blade Repeat the main cycle the main cycle being Goring Royal Royal. As I discussed during Goring Blade, you will do two Royal Authorities between every cycle. That's the only new thing we got here, but that's plenty enough to learn. Make sure you're learning this 2 to 1 ratio and the muscle memory it entails, as this movement is going to remain all the way up to level 90. And because of this, I will skip the karaoke opener for this one, the pace is the same, and that's the real benefit of the karaoke opener. So let's just move into the Stormblood skills and see a much more pace-changing set of skills. Level 62, Intervention. Let's just change the name of cover to Intervention Derogatory, because while it loses out on the pure strength available, all the downsides are also gone, costing 50 gauge and having a 30 yom range three times of that of cover. The target of this ability will take 10% less damage for 6 seconds. Further, if Rampart or Sentinel are active, this becomes a 20% damage reduction. This cannot be used on yourself. The niche uses of cover remain, but Intervention is just a million times more useful for general usage. There's no tiny range, it doesn't potentially put you at risk, but it's not nearly as effective at saving the target. A damage reduction can save them, but it's not a guarantee anymore. But of course, that range. Maybe it's just my experience, but you really, really notice how often players stand miles away, even when it's a bad idea when you start trying to use cover or intervention. Similarly though, there are niche uses for intervention. Pop this on your co-tank for tank busters you can't afford to cover. Or maybe you can afford to cover, but you're both tanking damage. Some bosses attack both tanks. Or there's two bosses, or an ad. You cover, you probably die, but Intervention protects your friend without your safety being lost. If you have Gage to spare, and you think you need to reduce an ally's damage, throw them in Intervention, especially if Rampart or Sentinel is already running. Don't waste them just to make Intervention stronger though, it's a bonus effect, not the main intent. And technically there is a 10 second cooldown, so you can't use it back to back, but usually it won't be used that close together. Level 64, Divine Magic Mastery. This is a bit of quality of life and real usage. All MP costs have been cut in half and you can't have your cast interrupted by taking damage. If you did use Clemency at all, you may have noticed some casts got cancelled due to taking damage. This will no longer occur. This trait is more preparation and benefiting our other skill. Level 64, Holy Spirit. Costing 1,000 mana and having a 1.5 second cast time, Holy Spirit does 250 potency of damage to a target. This is weaker than a full Royal Authority combo. In our opener, we can replace Shield Lob with this. Trash mobs, just stick to Shield Lob so you can keep on the move. Bosses, Holy Spirit to bring them to the middle of arenas. We'll see this in action at 70. Otherwise, when you have to disengage from the boss to dodge or such, firstly, Make sure you need to disengage at all. Secondly, instead of Shield Lob, use Holy Spirit. It's more than double the power of Shield Lob, so it's an easy choice. But be warned, it will break your combo if you're in the middle of one. Level 66, Enhanced Prominence. Now Prominence is getting in on the MP game. It restores 500 MP every time you use it in a combo. Once we start using magic in AoE, that does add up. Level 68, Requiescat. Alright, now we can use Holy Spirit. Requiescat deals 400 potency of damage to a target, then grants 5 stacks of Requiescat for 30 seconds. These stacks increase the power of Holy Spirit and a skill we don't have yet, Holy Circle. In the case of Holy Spirit, it doubles the power to 500 potency. Also, all cast times are set to zero. This is a really big hit. Anytime you use Requiescat, you want to be using 5 Holy Spirits within the timer. 
We're going to go deeper into how this works within the opener, but essentially, we want to alternate phases from now on. Melee phase for the duration of fight or flight, then requiescat for a magic phase, then repeat after some melee filler. Again, we'll talk deeper in a little bit. Otherwise, every requiescat means five strong magic attacks. Level 70, Passage of Arms. On a two minute cooldown, Passage of Arms causes you to hunker down and block all attacks. You also channel magic wings of protection with the floor shining as well at an eight yarm radius. Anyone standing within this shining spot has all damage reduced by 15%. This can last for 18 seconds, but will cancel if you are moving upon hitting the button or at any point after hitting the button. The issue is we often don't want to be holding onto this for the duration. Sure, for boss ultimates and eight man duties, you can sit there and just hold the shield. By now you've seen many times, bosses can't be attacked during their ultimate attacks. Reducing that damage is a good use, but not the best use. Outside of like, ultimate, you're gonna survive those ultimate attacks with little or no mitigation. No, the best use is to put you back to the party, hit passage of arms, then immediately cancel it. Notice the buff on your allies. Despite the animation being immediately cancelled or potentially not even appearing, the buff does get applied for a few seconds. It's a very short duration, but once you've learned the timing, you can use this to reduce the danger of multiple raid wides in all duties. If nothing else, in trash, if you are that desperate, yes, you can channel it for a little bit. Though you have to be pretty desperate at that point. Even clemency will be better, I'd say. So let's get into that opener. I already mentioned we'll be swapping back and forth between melee phases and magic phases, with a filler phase in between. Paladin has a number of different openers, but I'll mostly be highlighting the melee first opener. The other main opener for this job is rushing to the magic phase. Look it up if you'd like, but melee first is the general opener. Holy Spirit. Fast Blade. Fight or Flight. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Fast Blade. Riot Blade, Circle of Scorn, Royal Authority, Spirits Within, Requiescat, Fast Blade, Riot Blade, Royal Authority, Fast Blade, Riot Blade, Goring Blade, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Circle of Scorn, Fast Blade, Spirits Within, Riot Blade, Goring Blade, so let's talk about the placements of our abilities now. Spirits Within and Circle of Scorn were placed very weirdly, but now at level 70 they make a bit more sense when we consider party buffs. Almost every job at this point has at least one party based buff, unless they're a selfish job like Samurai or Black Mage. Using these where we do, we buff them under those party wide buffs. Now we add in Requiesca along with Spirits Within, a bit before our magic phase. Remember that the magic stacks last for 30 seconds, so we have tons of time to use Holy Spirit before it runs out. So put it under buffs where you can. Unless the boss is about to leave, we're gonna get our magic phase. After our magic phase ends, we'll want to refresh Goring Blade. Five Holy Spirits and the two melee hits before Goring is seven GCDs, only one less than the usual eight attacks. It's going to clip the dot a bit, but it keeps our cycle going properly but it will also make more sense at 90. And finally, let's mention the melee filler section. That goring blade at the end is the beginning of our melee filler. Ignoring the use of Circle of Scorn and Spirits Within, this is the short filler phase as defined by being unbuffed by Fight or Flight, and is just one cycle we've already practiced since level 60. One goring blade combo, two royal combos, and then we're back to the beginning of our rotation. We can just return to the beginning of the opener from here and repeat. This makes Paladin's rotation very easy to recover if you mess up, or there's some sort of disengagement from the boss leaving, or so on. It's a near perfect rotation that we can make even more perfect in Shadowbringers. But for now, this is our final opener. Really, up to level 90, the opener will have other small changes or additions, but the flow will not change. We'll see this at further level caps. For now, let's karaoke it. It's a bit longer, slightly faster paced, but very smooth for us to get through. Holy Spirit. 
Fast Blade. Fight or Flight. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Circle of Scorn. Royal Authority. Spirits Within. Rick Riescott. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Royal Authority. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Circle of Scorn. Fast Blade. Spirits Within. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Let's now get into Shadowbringers for some of the most loved skills in the Paladin Toolkit. Level 72, Holy Circle. Finally, we have an AoE use for magic. Holy Circle has the same cast and cost as Holy Spirit, but is a 5 yarm AoE around yourself. Similar to your AoE combo. Its power is 130 potency, or a massive 300 potency when under Requiescat. Every enemy you hit, full 300 potency. As a result, once you've established enmity on all enemies, go right into Requiescat for Holy Circle spam. After the fifth hit, you can pop into Fight or Flight for spamming prominence combos. And because of travel time, the time taken to pick everything up, and it being such a short 60 second cooldown, you can get a Requiescat in every fight. Start with this and you can do a big chunk of damage, ending the fight sooner. Level 74, Enhanced Sheltron. Sheltron now lasts for 6 seconds. It's really simple, a really small boost, but is a 150% length boost on paper. That's a good bit of extra damage negated for your most spammed cooldown. Level 74, Intervene. This is our first and only skill with charges, meaning it can store multiple uses at a max of 2 for Intervene. Each charge has a 30 second cooldown for a total of 60 seconds. The moment you use a charge, the next one begins to charge up. As for Intervene itself, it does a rushing attack of 150 potency. It's not very strong on its own, but the big breakthrough use is as a gap closer. It has a 20 yom range, and it says you rush at the target. That means gap close, and means you don't need to stay away from the boss for any significant amount of time. Run out of range for whatever AoE is making you walk out of range? Hit Intervene, and immediately start attacking again. If you know that there's a need to disengage, use one of your charges and hold onto the other for when it happens. This way you don't waste charges by not using them, but still keep one on hand for gap closing. Also, do not use this to pull! Please, just stop. Bring the boss into the middle of the arena. We aren't using Holy Spirit to open just because it's a strong start or anything. Placement of bosses matters, and getting it in range for your party matters. Please, just stop using this as a pulling move. Level 76, Sword Oath and Atonement. Sword Oath gives a buff to Royal Authority, essentially extending the combo. For 30 seconds, you are granted 3 stacks of Sword Oath. These stacks are only used for Atonement, a 390 potency hit that restores 400 MP each hit. After hitting Royal Authority, always follow up with Atonement. If you start a combo before doing so, you don't lose Sword Oath, but using Sword Oath will break a combo you start. The change this has on our opener and filler phases is significant, so we'll want to talk about that. I'll save it for during the opener talk though. Level 80, Confidier. This is a magic finisher. It can only be used when under Requiescat, and will consume all uses of Requiescat. It does a massive 900 potency AoE on a target, and all enemies within 5 yams of that target. There is no damage drop off so all enemies take the full 900 potency. That's massive! In single target or in AoE, instead of 5 uses of Holy Spirit or Circle, use them 4 times and finish off with a Confidier. You can also end your magic phase early with skipping 1 or more uses of Holy Spirit. The applications of this are extremely rare or based on kill timings. Like, the boss is about to die in the middle of your Requiescat phase. Throw out Confidier earlier than later to get the big hit before it dies. 
you're very unlikely to reach the next pool before Requiescat runs out, so might as well ensure you get the best hit. But now let's quick talk about the effects these skills had on our opener. Holy Spirit, Fast Blade, Fight or Flight, Riot Blade, Goring Blade, Fast Blade, Riot Blade, Circle of Scorn, Intervene, Royal Authority, Spirits Within, Requiescat, Atonement, Intervene, Atonement, Atonement, Fast Blade, Riot Blade, Goring Blade, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Confidier, Circle of Scorn, Fast Blade, Spirits Within, Riot Blade, Goring Blade. As mentioned, in Avene, you can keep one of these around if you're gonna need it for a gap closing. If you don't, though, just pop it off. Atonement merely replaces our second Royal Authority combo, and Confidier finishes off the magic phase with one use. It's simple, but it really hasn't done anything otherwise. The big change is what Atonement does to our filler phase. Once again, it will replace the second Royal Authority combo. But we don't use all three Atonements. Use two of them, and Fight or Flight will be near perfectly off cooldown for the moment we reach Riot Blade again. It's not super terrible if you use all three, especially if you have some stupidly high level of skill speed but it will cause your rotation to drift out of party-wide buffs. So it does benefit you to keep it to two atonements, but because of how little it changed the rotation overall, I'm going to skip the karaoke opener. We'll do that at 90. But first, we're going to have to see what Endwalker does to our skill set, and it does a little bit. Level 82, Sheltron Mastery and Holy Sheltron. Sheltron is being massively buffed. First, the duration is increased to 8 seconds for the block. Secondly, for 4 seconds, the original base lengths of Sheltron, damage is reduced by 15% before the block is even applied thanks to Knight's Resolve. Assuming a 15% damage reduction from the block, and it can be higher, that's roughly 28% damage reduction for 4 seconds at like a minimum. On top of that, we have Knight's Benediction, a 12 second heal over time effect for 250 potency, totaling to 1000 potency of healing. That's an entire clemency every use of Holy Sheltron. Supplement other cooldowns with your constant Holy Sheltron usage, and you're getting a Sentinel level reduction for a few seconds, slightly weaker Rampart for a few more, and a heal on top of it. Just make sure you're using Holy Sheltron's 12 seconds apart if you can. Make use of that heal. But it is understandable if you need to use back-to-back -back once the main Sheltron effect wears off. Things get rough in the first few Endwalker dungeons. Level 82, Enhanced Intervention. Intervention has also been buffed up a ton. Added 2 seconds as well for an 8 second duration. Knight's Resolve from Holy Sheltron is also here, giving the target 10% reduction for 4 seconds. It's a little weaker than the Sheltron version, but expected. But Knight's Benediction is also here, but it's the same power! 250 potency hot for 12 seconds. Now any using of Intervention is far stronger, closing the gap between it and cover a bit more. Though again, some different use cases between the two. There's still people standing far away after all. Level 84, Divine Magic Mastery 2. This adds a 400 potency heal to Holy Spirit and Holy Circle. Two and a half of these is the same power of a Clemency, which means you should be avoiding Clemency even more now. Again, did you die? No? Then why are you using Clemency? The healer literally is doing their job, and they can do it easier with you now being able to heal and attack at the same time. This has another consequence, though. Let's bring back up Divine Veil. This can only be procced by healing spells. Well, Holy Spirit and Holy Circle are attacking spells, but the heals count as healing spells. You can now proc Divine Veil without Clemency. If for whatever reason you're moving into Requiesca and your allies need a little pick-me-up, hit Divine Veil. Your own DPS will now heal you while giving your team some added defense. This is so much better. Level 84, Melee Mastery. 
This is a basic power boost to a bunch of our attacks, but poorly worded. It says the base potencies of Riot Blade, Royal Authority, and Holy Spirit are increased, but increases the combo and requiescat potencies too. Overall, just basically upping our power levels a bit. Level 86, Spirits Within Mastery and Expiacion. Spirits Within is now Expiacion, which is more than just a power boost. Spirits Within was a basic single target attack with MP regen. Expiacion is an AoE for 340 potency of damage on the first target and 170 potency to all additional targets. Try and aim to target the enemy in the middle of the pack to hit as many as possible. Assuming it's not a big enemy at least, the AoE is only 5 yams in radius, like an AoE combo. Level 88, Enhanced Divine Veil. Divine Veil now takes care of a bit of healing when being applied to allies. Any ally affected by the Shield of Divine Veil will receive 400 potency of healing. As we went over in Divine Magic Mastery 2, your spells count as healing spells now, meaning you can pop Divine Veil on your own, no problem. Time it right and you can shield your allies from harm after healing them too. Level 90, Blade of Faith, Truth, and Valor. This is an extension to your finisher. Confidia, as we know, is a massive AoE strike for 900 potency. These aren't nearly as impressive in power, but no less strong. After hitting Confidia, the button will change into Blade of Faith. Hitting Blade of Faith, change it to Truth. And hitting Truth, changes it to Valor. So all wrapped up into one button. All three of these will restore MP, so I'll skip that part. Blade of Faith is a 420 potency hit with 50% fall off, doing 210 potency of damage to all enemies after the first. Blade of Truth is 500 potency with fall off, doing 250 potency to all extra enemies. And finally, Blade of Valor makes it obvious what this was really doing. This does 580 potency to a target, 290 on all enemies beyond. It also places a dot on all enemies hit. The original target has an 80 potency dot, and all after the first, 40 potency. It lasts for 21 seconds, or 560 potency dot, 280 for all extra enemies. And it cannot be stacked with the Goring Blade, meaning in single target situations, we will skip Goring Blade until our next fight or flight, as the dot has been placed on the enemy for us. In essence, this is our Goring Blade combo after our magic phase. Just be careful you don't hit other attacks after Confidier. If you start your main combo before using your blade attacks, the combo will be lost, and the powerful hits with it. If it wasn't obvious, just like Confidier, this should never be skipped, potentially even rush to for AoE. They are so much stronger than your prominence combo, even if you put up fight or flight. Blade attacks, despite being giant swords, are still spells though, as evidenced by being able to cast them from a long range. So don't think you should use fight or flight for these either. And because of how this final skill set works, Endwalker basically hasn't changed our opener again. I'll do a karaoke opener for you just so that you have the new names being said, if you need to look back on this video. But otherwise we're just replacing that post got going blade combo with our magic blade combo. And of course Spirits Within with Expiation. But I really did mean it when I said our opener was finished in Stormblood. While it's not all strictly upgrades to stuff, hitting different buttons than before, it all resembles the same rotation. So let's karaoke one last time and see Paladin end. Holy Spirit. Fast Blade. Fight of Flight. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Circle of Scorn. Intervene. Royal Authority. Expiation. Requiescat. Atonement. Intervene. Atonement. Atonement. Fast Blade. Riot Blade. Goring Blade. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Confidio. Circle of Scorn. Blade of Faith. Expiation. Blade of Truth. Blade of Valor. I want to make one note here, and that's that you can put Fight of Flight 
right before a goring blade if you're having issues fitting in both goring blades within the window. Otherwise, just remember the filler phase. Two atonements instead of three, then right back into your opener when fight or flight comes off of cooldown. And then you've got yourself a very smooth rotation going. Just stop touching clemency, please. Thank you for watching this Paladin 1 to 90 leveling skills guide. Feel free to give feedback or ask questions on what might still be confusing to you. I am always seeking to improve, as should you. Don't stop with this guide, even if I succeeded in helping you improve. Please leave a rating, comment, sub, those really do help creators. Or even go follow my Patreon. Have fun in your adventures across Eorzea. And may the power of Anne and Nidhogg slay waste to your enemies.